Hello and welcome to Mobility Mastery. I'm Alicia and this is Fast Fresh Effects episode two. <laughs> um, so we're diving into three facts a week here about fascia and then I'm talking about why that matters to me from the perspective of, you know, a person that owns a body, has a lot of fascia in here, you know, I have things I'm trying to either uh, heal or optimize um, through fascia research and fascial optimization. Um, and then of course, uh, it matters to me professionally because that's what I do for a living is educate you guys and certify people on my method of fascia release. And I used to work one-on-one -on -one with a lot of people in my private practice, not so much anymore. Um, so this is episode two and I'm just gonna dive right in here. And number one, we've got fascial junctions get the most congested. And I've actually filmed a YouTube video specifically on this, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here, but it is a fascia fact that I feel, if you wanna study fascia, know how to use fascia release to optimize and actually get the most bang for your buck when you are doing fascia release, it's something to be aware of, so I had to include it in this series. Um, so what I mean is uh, fascial junctions like your quadriceps where the, that muscle group meets the IT band, for example, um, tends to be more congested than um, just the, you know, the singular muscle, like just the IT band. Um, and then of course, in a muscle group like the quadriceps, since there are four of them, where those individual um, muscle bundles uh, overlap or meet, um, though that area tends to get the most congested congested within the quadriceps. So if you know anatomy or are willing to study it, you can actually make your fascia release efforts a lot faster if you know this fascia fact. Uh, number two, this is a big one. Fascia can withstand up to 2000 pounds of force. And uh, I'm gonna extract out from that why that matters to me in just a minute, um, but that's pretty extraordinary. So you know, it's up to, it doesn't mean it always can withstand 2000 pounds of force, but this is something the scientific community has quote proven. Um, and actually this argument has been used or this, this fact, um, scientific fact has been used to make the argument that you can't actually release fascia, that you can't change it. You can't impact it. Why bother foam rolling, you know, get massaged for other reasons, but not to change your fascia because it can withstand up to 2000 pounds of force without changing. Um, so I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. Um, and number three, fascia assists in cell to cell and brain body communication. Um, and I'm including both of those here because I mostly just want to say my interpretation of that, uh, based on working with so many people in pain since 2008 is that fascia is really like the super highway of communication between the brain and body, but also between elements of your body between different elements, right? Um, so in episode one, you learned that uh, fascia wraps not just muscle fiber and muscles, but it actually wraps organs and um, bones and uh, nerve endings. Um, so it's super abundant and it wraps all kinds of things. And part of fascia's uh, you know, makeup, if you will, what it's made of is something called the extracellular matrix. So, um, this is less true in the superficial fascia. It's more true, um, in the deeper fascia, uh, and very, very abundant in the gut. Um, but this extracellular matrix has something called brown substance in it. And anyway, it's supposed to be, um, kind of a lubricant, but also a place for, let's say um, cellular waste to get excreted and then taken out of the body. Um, and then cells will actually extract nutrients from the extracellular matrix into themselves. Uh, but it also will take a signaling molecule, for example, um, from one cell and it'll put it into the extracellular matrix to be heard by or received by um, the receptor cell. Uh, so I'm not gonna get super sciencey here <laughs> with you for that. If this is like right up your alley and you're a super nerd like me, then I encourage you to do your own research um, based on what I'm sharing. But then what I actually feel is even more important from a very broad human impact standpoint is fascia's role in brain body communication. Um, and I'm talking about conscious communication as well as unconscious. 
So a lot of people, you know, define um, or think about neuroscience or brain science um, in terms of just the brain, right? But interestingly, neuroscience is actually defined as the study of the nervous system. And the nervous system lives pretty much in your body, not your brain. Um, and so your brain and body always have to be communicating, right? For you to um, be functioning just on, you know, to be breathing, to have your heart beating, to uh, move, you know, muscles, to have proper communication there. So brain-body communication is super important. But the one thing that I want to stress here that feels critical to me, and I'll extract more on that in just a minute, is that it's not just the brain communicating to the body. And that's usually how we think about it. And we also tend to think about the brain as the mind. And I think those are two separate things. Um, but you know, that's maybe up for debate um, and not the point of this video. But the point is your body communicates to your brain just as much, if not more. Uh, I actually think, you know, the, the purpose of the nervous system predominantly is to gather data um, and then interpret that data and send the interpretation to the brain so the brain can cue the appropriate action or behavior necessary based on that data and interpretation. And this is happening at the conscious level, like I said, and at the subconscious or unconscious level. And something I teach in my um, courses and trainings with people that we go really deep on because there's so much to it is that your subconscious lives in your body and it lives in your nervous system. And that's really the origin place of your unconscious or automated programming and behaviors, patterns, however you want to word that. So super, super, super important <laughs> to me. Um, so let's just go back through these and kind of extract from them why I think they matter. And like I said, I'm sharing this from two major perspectives. One, personally. So I may have some personal bias here. I always like to <laughs> give that little disclaimer. Um, and then I definitely want to hear from you. Um, and then the other one, of course, is professionally. What implications have I seen based on these facts for um, my private practice clients? Like how could I use these facts to get them better results or to improve my method of fascia release um, or overcome challenges? So uh, fascial junctions get the most congested. I mean, this is pretty self-explanatory. Um, if they get the most congested, it's a really great place to look or palpate um, as a first pass when you're wanting to get the most out of say the 30 to 40 seconds you're spending on a particular spot. So let's say, like I said before, you're going to your quads. Well, you might want to rotate a little bit towards the IT band or a little bit towards the adductor and find out what's there or go up towards the hip flexor, right? Because there's a junction here of um, not just, you know, the TFL and the IT band, but also some of those other adductor muscles and also your, um, your psoas and some other things. So fascial junctions can be a great place to investigate for fascial restriction that could be limiting range of motion or causing pain, pinching a nerve, stuff like that. Um, and number two, uh, this is, this is a, like I said, a big one. <laughs> so fascia can withstand up to 2000 pounds of force. The way that I look at that is a little different than the way it's talked about in the scientific community, because I've had a, you know, firsthand experiential, um, or I guess like a firsthand experience, um, with my clients, uh, where I'm maybe using my whole body weight sometimes to step on them. Um, they may or may not get a result, uh, based on different factors, right? Um, and I'm trying to actually release fascia. Um, but also the, the more important thing to me where I've formulated this, a lot of this theory that I'm about to share is based on the results I got with them that allowed them to tolerate or withstand more quote force, AKA me stepping on them. So some people um, can only tolerate five pounds or even one pound of my weight on a given area of fascia because either one of two things is happening. Either there's something in their nervous system that's causing them to react to that confrontation and or their fascia is so unhealthy, it's so restricted, it's so brittle, or it's so unable to distribute that mechanical force through the whole body that it's intensely painful um, and they can't really tolerate it, right? So the, when, you, when you read about this if you, online, if you go look it up, it does say up to 2,000 pounds of force. Um, so in my opinion, fascia can actually 
withstand up to 2,000 pounds of force without deforming or changing if it's optimized, if it's at its healthiest. Um, now, to talk about the argument that I mentioned earlier that some people say, because of this, how could you change fascia if it can withstand that much force? Well, I look at that a couple ways. One, yes, I think it's fascinating and definitely worth considering that one of fascia's jobs is actually to protect you. Um, it is to withstand up to 2,000 pounds of force if you get thrown off a horse, if you fall off a ladder, if you get in a car accident, right? Um, now, we live in a modern world with all kinds of things happening that didn't, you know, weren't happening when we were evolving this thing called fascia to withstand up to 2,000 pounds of force. But I believe it evolved to protect us in numerous ways from various things, both internal and external, by absorbing mechanical stress coming into the body. Um, that doesn't mean it's unchangeable. My question is just, well, you know, given, given this fact, given these parameters, how can we change it? So that was the question I really um, sat with and worked with in my private practice with clients. And um, the theory that I've come to uh, regarding this fact is that it def fascia will definitely resist change. This is why you know I've filmed a video called The One Rule of Effective Fascia Release and why massage doesn't release fascia, which people love to hate me for. <laughs> um, mostly massage therapists, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to shit on any massage therapist. I was one, um, but fascia doesn't change easily. It's very difficult to get it to change. Um, so in my experience, what will change it is getting the fascia to engage through active movement to shear fascial fibers apart. And we're gonna kind of get into that later. It's not really pertinent to the fascia fact, but I want you to take this into consideration when you're searching for either people, practitioners, professionals, whether online or offline, to help you with your fascia um, challenges or if you are looking to optimize, because if they're not talking about this and they're um, talking about it pr from the perspective of melting it or you know changing it with just their mind or you know I don't know, like, yes, the mind's super powerful. Yes, relaxation and calming the nervous system will impact your fascia. I don't believe it'll actually release it. So we're going to talk more about that in another episode. Um, but yeah, this is important to know about. All right. Number three, uh, fascia assistance, cell to cell and brain, brain body communication. Um, there's a lot we could extract here. Like I could probably do a whole training just on this and extract all kinds of various, um, you know, scientific facts as well as things I've discovered in my own body. And then with clients, of course, um, but to me, the biggest implication here is that there is a relationship between fascia and you know, all the communication, you know, maybe not all, but most of the communication signals that are happening in your body at the conscious or unconscious level. To me, that has huge implications. So the more conscious you can make it and the more intentional you can be about optimizing your fascia so that cell to cell and brain body communication not only happens more efficiently, but um, at that uh, unconscious cop competence level, right? Where you've made it conscious and maybe intentional and you have to be engaged with the process, but at some point it becomes an unconscious competence where it's happening and you don't have to think about it anymore, but you've assisted your fascia to do those communications in an optimal way, as opposed to unoptimal or you know, in a dysfunctional way. So there are a lot of implications here for why we might head towards dysfunction if the fascia or the fascial system is um, maybe unhealthy or restricted or blocking that communication or those communication signals. And then also what we can do from the perspective of optimizing those communication channels and actually assisting our brain and body to have better communication. Um, and, you know, I think it goes without saying, but one of them for me is what a tremendous amount of energy you're going to free up if you free up those channels to where, I mean, communication between your brain and body is happening, you know, at lightning speed. It's not going through a sluggish system. It doesn't have to fight its way through congested fascia um, to do its job, whether at the cell to cell level or the brain body communication level. So lots more we could talk about here, um, but now I really want to hear from you. So let's have fun with this discussion. I would love for you to, um, 
maybe today, if you're willing, pick one fact that blew you away or you found super interesting or maybe is really relevant to you right now. And then I want you to share about it. Like what blew you away? How do you think it's going to implicate, you know, how do you think it's going to impact your life? What are the implications for your, um, you know, well-being? Uh, what are you taking away from this video? Or do you have anything to add? Are you researching this yourself? Is this a topic that fascinates you? Do you want to share anything related to one of these below? So um, please comment below the video. I can't wait to hear your answers. So I think this is super interesting. I'm especially curious to hear what you guys think of this one. Um, and we're gonna talk more about it um, in coming episodes. But that's it for episode two. So if you're new here, uh, make sure to hit the subscribe button because we're just getting started with this particular series. There are many more to come and we're putting videos out multiple times a week right now. Uh, if you join my email community, which I would love to have you join, I've got some free resources for you and I also share tips uh, and stories that I don't anywhere else in those newsletters that go out every single week. You can do that below. There's a um, button that you can click or a link you can click um, below this video. So I hope you join. I hope you join my Facebook group as well, but mostly I hope you comment on this video because I really wanna have some fun discussions around these facts. And then I wanna see how you're gonna use these facts in your life to get out of pain, heal trauma, and optimize your mind-body connection. All right, I will see you next time. Bye.